Our journey begins in Hongchon in South Korea. We are about 100 kilometers east of Seoul. There is supposed to be an unusual prison. Koreans go here out of their own free will. Into tiny cells without any contact to the outside world. Do they want to punish themselves? What secret is behind this prison? In a luxury van, a prison employee brings the new inmates. We are meeting Naman, a 51-year-old Korean from Seoul. Three days of prison lie ahead of him, out of his own free will. Hello? Yeah. Mr. Naman? Hi, I'm Miriam. I'm Miriam. How are you? Miriam, I'm good, yes. thank you. Yeah. How are you doing right now? How are you I feeling right good, now? Yeah. I'm good, yeah. I'm good, happy. Yeah. The inmates are issued with uniforms, just like in a prison, so to speak. They have to sign up and get changed. So this is really not a joke. Everywhere there are cameras. What is Naman doing here? Why am I here? Uh, to put myself, actually my body, into the prison. Right. Not an explanation, but at least this really seems to be voluntary. The inmates pack their possessions into special jute bags. Toothpaste and uh, uh, skin cream and uh, in a shirt, something like that, at the minimum. And a laptop? No laptop. And no mobile. Naman and the others have to hand in their phones. An employee locks them away. For three days, I'm not, not allowed to use my phone. So anything might happen, but I have to accept it. It is Friday, 4 p.m. Naman sees his room for the first time, or to be more precise, his cell. 28 of these are next to each other here, all furnished rather simply. So this is going to be your new home? Yeah, <laughs> my prison. What do you think about it? The a little narrow though, it's good to me. And where is the bed? In the wardrobe, Naman finds a thin mattress. I can put this here. This is my bed. <laughs> the other inmates, too, are moving into their cells. All the rooms are only five square meters plus a small toilet. But why are the rooms so small? The inventor of this voluntary prison explains. This sounds almost a bit like a detoxification center. Prison boss Kwon shows us the garden. The 51-year-old has fulfilled his big dream with this prison. He used to be a state prosecutor, but why did he have the dream of building his own penitentiary? Uh, the capital Seoul is a pulsating 10 million people strong metropolis. The working world is strictly hierarchical and 15 hour working days are the norm. The inmates are escaping this stress here. I have nothing to hear, nothing to think about my life, my wife, my family, anything. Just to think about pure ingredients in my mind, myself. And so that this really works, the hotel manager and the boss's wife lock Naman and the others in. At 5 p.m. on the dot, the doors are bolted shut. Oh, Ona Kwan also lets himself get locked in by his own wife. Isn't that a bit strange, <laughs> locking up your own husband? 
사실 지금 뭐 장난으로 뭐 좋다 그랬는데 어, 밖에서 많이 힘들어요. 어, 뭐 행복공장 이사장이기도 하고 또 어, 변호사 일도 계속 해야 되고 그래서 어, 많이 힘들 거예요. 그래서 여기 들어가 있는 게 제일 잘쉴수 있는 시간이라 어, 안 나오고 내일 모레까지 잘 쉬면 좋겠어요. 이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이이
Happy or not, at 5 p.m. it's back to the cells. The inmates pay about $130 for two nights and three days. A prison for de-stressing and to become happy. At least for the overworked Koreans, it seems to be working. We are leaving South Korea and move on to the Isla Mujeres in Mexico. Off the coast here, a man has realized his dream of his own island. But he didn't buy it. No, he built it. The dropout Richard Sower has been living in Mexico for 15 years and for the same amount of time he has been working on his lifetime project. Well, we have a lot of trash around the world building up more and more, and it's polluting the oceans and everywhere. And I came up with this idea because I really believe it's the solution to actually creating more land that's green. The trash becomes the treasure. Empty plastic bottles are treasure? For the 59-year-old, they are. What other people just throw away is the basis for his island. Joycey Island. Richard came up with the name himself. For four years, he's been working on the 20 times 30 meter large plastic platform. By the way, officially, it is classified as a boat. 150,000 plastic bottles fastened to wooden planks give it buoyance. On top of that, plywood, cloth, and sand. Garbage walls insulate the house. The roots of the mangroves are intertwining with everything over time and are holding everything together. Joycey Island is Richard's third island. Hurricanes had destroyed the previous ones. But Richard keeps continuing. He is convinced of his idea. These bottles are totally preserved when they're underneath the water, when I turn this pallet over and there's no sunlight getting in, the bottles are totally preserved. They can last for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. Richard's goal? To build ecologically. The most important thing is that the bottles are not damaged and also properly closed. The fruit sacks stop them from floating away. And really, waste is turned into new living space this way. So this is a bottle that came out only after a couple of months and it's got corals growing on it, look. So the corals grow over the whole thing and it becomes encapsulated and like mummified, right? So everything is totally preserved. Once in a while, Richard has to do some maintenance and put in some more bottles. And then I get my fork and I push it under. Especially after it has rained. Then the sand and the house get very heavy and the island sinks down by up to 10 centimetres. For Richard, this often feels like Sisyphus work. The trained carpenter also built the house himself. Richard lives by himself and he rarely sees his four children who are back in England. Instead, he is living his dream of a 100% self-sufficient island. With the sawdust on here on top of a cloth, this opens the cloth and allows it to go through with the weight it's pushing through this cloth. The excrement goes down to the garden with the shavings and is composting uh, for the roots of the mangroves. And then when it piles up too high, I take it out when it's turned to real soil and I take it around and I, it feeds the plants like real great fertilizer. The locals tolerate Richard. He's allowed to moor in the bay free of charge. Lucky for Richard, as in his job as a street musician, he doesn't make a lot of money, and his income is also very irregular. So this is, so this is the little pathway going down, and these are a few different plants growing out from all the trash that doesn't float. So like glass bottles, aluminium cans, plastic bags, cardboard, carton. One day, Richard wants to go out into the open sea with his plastic bottle island, but that might still take a while. We continue in Greenland, the biggest island in the world. It is almost completely covered in a layer of ice. Farming, fruit, vegetables, not a chance. But still, people live here. 
in the 1,000 people strong village of Tasilak, we are meeting Inuit Julius on his daily food procurement. This small fjord, no, not so many of seals. There are many better hunting places in uh, far away. It's, uh, we will come to 45 kilometers from here. Only in the summer months do ships or helicopters bring imported foods from Denmark. The only own source of nourishment for the Inuit is what they can catch themselves. But even for most fish, the water north of the Arctic Circle is too cold. Uh, some, uh, many times we need to make uh, uh, five holes to uh, find the fishes. And when we find them, good chance to cut. But like so often, Julius doesn't catch anything. No fish will bite. In order to feed his wife, his four children and his in-laws, he has to continue further into the icy desert to catch seals. You need to know what you do. You need to know a lot of nature, about, about, the, about the area and, uh, and the ice conditions. So yeah, it's dangerous because uh, we need, we, every time we need to come out from the, from the village or city. So that's why it's dangerous. If something were to happen to an Inuit out here, he would be as good as dead. Only a couple of weeks ago, Julius's best friend passed away out here. How this happened, nobody knows. But still, Julius comes out here all by himself every day. We fall. If I fall down to the water, I need to come up very fast because uh, the feeling of uh, the cold is extreme. It's uh, like a thousand, thousand of uh, small mills sticking in the body. It's, uh, no radio, no electricity, no mobile phone mast. If you go hunting in this wasteland, you are completely on your own. I see a seal in this direction, far away. Ah, right. We can't see anything. Not even using the binoculars, we can catch a glimpse of what Julius has discovered with his naked eye. If you haven't learned to hunt like an Inuit in your childhood, out here by yourself, you would starve without a doubt. But the Inuit and the inhabitants of Greenland didn't have any other chance to survive. If they don't catch a seal or some fish, there is nothing to eat. Seeing a seal doesn't mean that you will catch it. They are extremely shy and very fast. The white suit is supposed to help not scare the prey away. missed. And the chances of finding two seals in one day are more than slim. We was too close. I shoot from there. The seal was here and the ball come up there. By now it's the afternoon and still Hunter Julius hasn't caught any food for his wife and children on the biggest island in the world. If he doesn't find something soon, the table will stay empty tonight. It's always 50-50 to find the seals. Only the indigenous people of Greenland may hunt as many seals as they want for their personal requirements. This is permitted by law, as there obviously aren't that many alternatives. Against all odds, Julius actually finds another seal in the late afternoon. This time, it's a hit. The animal is dead immediately. The Inuit use every part of the seal, from the meat to the fur. We have some food for dinner tonight. Despite the ice, the cold and the loneliness, Julius never wants to leave here again. I live Denmark, in, in Denmark. But uh, it was enough. So East Greenland are my home. That's here I feel home. Maybe 10 years more, I will think other ways. But uh, now I feel home here. 
If you live in such a hostile environment, you have to stick together. I give uh, this uh, some of meat for local, some of local people. They need. They are some friends, and they done cut a seal today. So that's why. Everyone takes care of each other. The best parts for the family, the bones for the dogs. This way, the Inuit have provided for themselves for centuries on this hostile island. For us, our journey continues off the coast of Nagasaki. It is five o'clock in the morning. Captain Bobasan is getting his boat ready for a trip to the former coal island, Gunkanshima. Whenever the rough seas permit it, he takes the historian Dotuku Sakamoto back to his former home. Forty years ago, about 5,000 people inhabited the island, which is as big as eight football fields. But one day, the residents had to leave the island. Visiting his former home is always difficult for Dotoku. The abandoned houses in the north of the island have been in danger of collapsing for 10 years. Therefore, access is strictly prohibited. Visitors may only go to the south of the island. We try to land in the south of Gunkanshima, but no chance. The waves are simply too high. But Dutoku knows a secret mooring place on the north side in the restricted zone. Here, the sea is much calmer. Dutoku wants to walk to the south from here. We accompany him and film without an official permit. The Japanese call it the Island of Ghosts. Dutoku tries to calm the ghosts of the town with holy water and a prayer. He is the only former resident who is allowed to enter the exclusion zone, and also the only person that wants to. For the others, it is too sad and too creepy. For decades, typhoons are sweeping over the unprotected island, and the water masses are slowly washing everything away. The ruins of a once flourishing mining town with over 5,000 inhabitants, a school, and a hospital. Dutoku is fighting for the recognition of the island by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site, a memorial against exploitation of resources. We leave Gunkanchima and travel on to Bangkok. At 17 million visitors per year, it is the metropolis of Southeast Asia. The many temples of the city are part of every sightseeing tour, and a visit to the infamous Khao San Road is an absolute must. But we are looking for Bangkok's most notorious attraction, the Ghost Tower. At one of the best addresses in Bangkok, the Saturn unique tower stands at 49 stories high. But why is there a haunted house in one of the most expensive areas of the megacity?
The haunted tower has a twin that houses mainly luxury apartments and offices and was also used as a set for the Hollywood blockbuster Hangover 2. The ghost tower itself is still just the shell. It is closed off and guarded around the clock. Still, many try to access it somehow. The sign clearly states, photography, filming and entering strictly prohibited. But why is the 185-metre-high apartment building in one of the best areas empty? In 1997, Thailand experienced a serious economic crisis and dragged the surrounding countries down with it. The Thai baht lost 40% of its value within a very short period of time. More than 300 building sites in Bangkok ground to a halt back then. The ghost tower was one of them. We are meeting a couple that prefer not to be recognized. They have found a way into the tower. As it seems to be tolerated at the moment, we enter the carcass of the building. But soon we face the next obstacle, steel doors. The view of Bangkok from above is what drives the two adrenaline junkies up to the top. The pictures will later be uploaded to Facebook as proof. The couple are in luck. With a ladder, they can bypass the steel doors. But they aren't completely comfortable, as in these shafts, five men are said to have died during the construction. Bring water, a good tip. The pair have brought two bottles per person. Not even halfway, and the adventurers have already worked up quite a sweat. But for this view, it is all worth it. But they don't take a lot of time to rest. It is too eerie in the dark stairwell. A Swedish guy committed suicide here on this floor. The night when one photographer went up there and took a photo and on his way down, he smelled something and he sort of followed the smell and he said that he heard or he felt something calling him so he walked on the floor and then that's how he found the body. As if this wasn't enough, the young woman tells us that the tower was built on an old graveyard. The legend says that the ghosts of the dead still haunt the building, therefore the name Ghost Tower. Even though the two don't really believe in ghosts, the countless horror stories that they have heard about this place do give them the creeps. But then it is finally done. The ascent took a whole 45 minutes. Will the tower ever be finished? No one knows, as the building shows some serious construction defects that would make a further development extremely expensive. Therefore, the ghost tower of Bangkok will probably stay this way for some years to come. But it should definitely not be climbed. We leave the Thai capital and move on to Iceland. Iceland, the remote volcanic island in the icy sea, has the reputation of producing the strongest humans on Earth, and this since the age of the Vikings. With the successes of their strong men, the Icelanders have proved that they are true giants. What are they doing different to the others? We set out to discover this secret. We are in the so-called nest of giants. 
The owner, Magnus Ver Magnusson, is four times the winner of the title Strongest Man in the World. There's no point giving these crazy guys new equipment. <laughs> They'll make it look old very fast. <laughs> I'm actually a mechanic welder. That's what I learned in, in profession. So uh, I, may, um, I know how to build stuff out of metal, wood, whatever. This here has nothing to do with a gym as we know it. Here only training equipment for real men can be found, made from steel and concrete, as big and as heavy as possible. So I, I designed this thing. Look like a mooring bit. You have to pick this up and and walk with it. And the only way to uh, you know basically make it get to be a good strongman and everything, I believe is you know you have to have that hardcore gym, the hardcore surrounding, where it doesn't matter how you dress, it's how much you lift. Iceland's giants train daily at Magnus's gym. This is Ari Gunnarsson. He is another strongman here. So this is the Mac of strongman. He will go to train. Ari is a professional heavy athlete and is officially among the strongest men in Iceland, therefore also in the world. He only trains here. Nowhere else is there a studio of this kind that is especially equipped for the strongman disciplines. And a human body is a... It's an amazing thing. Push it to the limits. This competitive discipline is called the farmer's walk. Ari has to walk as far as possible, as quickly as possible, with two huge 150 kilo weights in his hands. Then it is the cameraman's turn. Do either you want to try it? <laughs> Challenge accepted. 150 kilos per hand? No problem for the two meter tall cameraman, right? When the professionals do it, it looks so easy. <laughs> At least he earns Ari's respect. But back to the pros. They are currently training for the next world championship. We are only 320,000 and we have eight World Strongest Man titles. I think that's pretty unique. The extremely tough training and the high level of performance at the giant's nest makes the Icelanders so strong. But this could be applicable to strong men in other countries too. We want to understand more precisely what is behind the incredible strength of the Icelanders. We ask around in Iceland's capital, Reykjavik. The question, what makes you so strong? I don't know, maybe the bad weather and the wind too. Yeah, it's hard, hard conditions. We used hard work, so we work a lot, so it's definitely that where you're strong. On a building site, we get another tip. Eat meat and work every day. We are working. We are Vikings. The most typical answer would be that we are like Vikings. Many Icelanders still see themselves as Vikings. We want to find out more about this and arrange to meet Magnus. He takes us to an especially mythical place. It's, uh, it's like a sacred place. And uh, there's a big rock. You always go there and pay your respects. Magnus leads us to a remote graveyard one hour away from Reykjavik. Here, a famous Viking is said to be buried. Iceland was a very hard country to settle in and to, you know, live in. You know, only the uh, strongest and toughest survived. The other ones died. And I think uh, that's one of the uh, heritage that makes Icelandic people strong. Do you also recognize yourself as a uh, Viking still, or...? I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Viking, yes. Everybody that's 
you know, comes from a long, old families. They come from the Vikings. A real Viking was also Iceland's first famous strongman. To me and many others, you know, Jean Paul Sigmarsson was like the pioneer for uh, Icelanders in, in World's Strongest Man and in the Strongman. I'm a Viking of Iceland! He made the Icelandic strongman famous. In the 1980s, he won many world championships. You know, I, I actually like the old, old traditional kind of Viking thing with strongmen. They were lifting big rocks. Uh, and even in the older days over here, when uh, you had, had to go to be a fisherman, you had to prove yourself. And they had, you know, a couple of rocks laying around. And if you couldn't lift the, lift the the big rock, you were not allowed on, on, on the boat. Mm -hmm. You couldn't become a fisherman. To summarize, Viking culture and the hard living conditions on the harsh volcanic island make the Icelanders strong. But what does this mean for the daily lives of the men? We are allowed to accompany strongman Ari to his job. Ari, didn't you forget the jacket? Oh, this is fine, brother. We're supposed to be Vikings in Iceland, so this is a food wire for me. Ari may be one of the strongest men in the world, but unfortunately, he can't make a living from it. It would be a dream come true if I just lived on a strong man, but it's very hard in Iceland. So small country and small population, so it's, it, is, it is what it is. You just have to do it. Being a strong man in Iceland doesn't only cost a lot of strength, but also a lot of money. And for this, Ari has to, like any other person, work. His super strength here is only good for the amusement of his colleagues. This is the best time of the day for her. Yeah. She gets My to see her <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She always hangs out and waiting for me. Yeah. The giant works as a lifeguard at a small swimming pool in the center of Reykjavik. His job, to sit at the side of the pool for 10 hours and watch the swimmers. My life is pretty simple. I work here in the doorman and I have three kids and a wife. It's just the simple ring that I, that I do. So uh, I like what I do. Ari's highlight in eight years, he once saved a man from drowning. But mostly, he tells us, it is very quiet here. At least he can recuperate here. The hard training and the competition don't pass by the giant without leaving their marks. I tore my back when I was taking bench press. I tore it, and it's like a big hole here. Um, and then I tore my bicep tendon here. I was I was flipping tire, 400 kilos. And I had to go to surgery and recover from that. So it's not always sunshine, but you know, you have to step down, you have to recover from it, you have to work through the injuries, and then just come back and fight again. Ari doesn't only have the strength to lift hundreds of kilograms of steel, but also the willpower to do so, and a stoic tranquility about him. Is there something else behind the strength of the Icelanders? Probably just good, good food, natural food. Lisi. Drink Lisi. <laughs> Probably because of the Lisi. Lisi? Is that a secret magic potion? Let's be Icelandic Lisi. This is the Lisi. This is made out of like uh, the liver. The, this is cod liver, you see? Full day vitamin shot like that. And many Icelanders have it every day. It's made from the livers of cod and other species of fish. It contains a lot of nutrients, especially iodine, and high quantities of vitamin A and D. It is very good for the immune system and a strong body. In the evening, we're invited to Ari's house to have dinner with him and his family. 
In order to keep his body as strong as it is, the giant has to consume up to 10,000 calories per day. That is about 75 pork chops. We are skeptical if he can really achieve this all purely with a healthy diet. Steroids, of course, help. But uh, we all are in very, very good shapes. No, no illnesses. And so you can always, you can all, people always play with steroids cards so easily. But people don't know how this works. Heavy athletes, time after time, have to battle with doping accusations. Harry distances himself from this. If that really is the truth, we cannot tell. At least he has a reason. Strongman records, personal records, gym, doesn't mean anything. This, this, this means everything in life. I'll never risk my health. Imagine them growing up not without me. No. Harry's explanation for his superhuman strength? So it's a combination of many things, but Mostly you train, eat, sleep, and work. So the sheer strength of the Icelanders has many reasons. Yeah, true Viking. Viking power. The concentration of strong men, the incredibly hard training, the gravitas of the Viking tradition, the isolation, the harsh living conditions in Iceland, as well as the amazing willpower of its giants to go right up to their personal boundaries, makes the Icelanders invincible. We leave the Isle of the Strong Men and travel on to China. The province of Qingjiang covers an area of 1.6 million square kilometers. In the capital, Urumqi, we are asking about a mysterious picture. We head off in a northwesterly direction. Three hours later, we arrive in Anxihai. At the edge of the town, a huge canyon. And from about a height of 300 meters, the picture that we are looking for. Huge fields of countless chilies. But what are the spicy pods doing here in the middle of nowhere? And who brought them here? 20 kilometers on, instead of a barren, stony desert, chili fields. It is autumn and therefore time for the harvest. China is the biggest producer of chilies, 60 million tons per year. That's about 46% of the global chili production. Most of them come from remote regions such as Qinxiang. Ma Waikyang is the boss here. The 28-year-old is responsible for 10 fields with a total size of 130,000 square meters. It is the biggest farm in the town. The harvester is only borrowed. The price of $50,000 to buy their own is simply too high for most farmers. Mm. 110 horsepower and 3.6 meters of cutting width. 10,000 square meters of field in only one hour. But after just half an hour, everything suddenly comes to a halt. The harvester has broken down. Very bad news for Maui Qian. If he doesn't manage to harvest in time, the chilies lose spiciness and consequently he loses money. The problem? In the small town, there are only 30 machines in total and all the farmers need to harvest at the same time. 
不夸张，因为我们这个地方就是主要生产这个经济作物，这个辣椒就是我们主要生产的一个一种经济作物。像往年年年都是这样子，这地方都是这么多，种这么多。嗯、呃，然后我们这地方也举办有辣椒节呀、啊，这样子。嗯、呃，在这个外外地的这地方来拉辣的人也特别多。His last chance, his farmer friends. Crisis meeting in a close-by restaurant. Because there are so many Muslims in the region, everything on the menu is halal. The speciality of the house, oiga chicken, with of course, lots of chili. The hot paprika is the most used spice in the world. Chili powder or homemade chili paste. In this restaurant, there is not one dish without the spicy pod. This lajiao, na, can be cooked, can be cooked. It has many vitamins, especially sugar. So, people are very good. Very good. Dinner among farmers. Ma Weiqiang asks for help. Another four of his ten fields still need to be harvested as quickly as possible. Luckily, his friend is prepared to lend him some migrant workers tomorrow. The solidarity among the farmers is strong. Nine a.m. in one of Mao Qiang's fields. The migrant workers have already been harvesting for three hours by hand. Twenty workers reap a field of ten thousand square meters in two days. In comparison, for the harvesting machine, it only takes one hour. The advantage: this way, fewer chilies are destroyed and the yield is higher. Unfortunately, the farmers can only employ a certain number of migrant workers. The reason: political disputes with the Chinese government in the region. Xinjiang is regarded as a conflict area in China. Still, Li comes here from her home village, 2,000 kilometers away, in order to make money. She can pick up to 300 kilos per day. Here, the land is very big. Uh, uh, work is very hard. I, uh, I earn money. Uh, I go home to take care of my children to school. Twelve o'clock, lunchtime. As it is too far to go into town, Mao Qiang supplies his workers with food right on the field. He is very grateful that his friend has let him borrow his workforce. Otherwise, he could have lost a lot of money. The first part of the chili harvest is completed. It's not hard, because this thing, making this, uh, this chili paste, is very important. Every climate needs to be attention. For example, in the summer, when you choose a good climate, you can put it in the ground, otherwise, it will not come out. Then, in the summer, you have to wait for the summer. 过了这个后又要积水，按时积水。要是看水的话，它肯定要减产。还有这个就是现在冰冻害也厉害的很，要按时按季节把药打好。After the harvest, the chilies go on a small trip, 20 kilometers along the B road. Already along the side of the road, everything is red. Everything here is about chilies. About an hour later, arrival at the Anshihai Canyon. Every couple of minutes, a fully loaded tractor arrives. Migrant workers continuously unload them with pitchforks for 10 hours per day. Among them, Miao Shu, the 58-year-old, owns a chili farm himself. <laughs> The number of chili farms has doubled in the last years. On the one hand, the farmers can support each other. On the other, the growing supply is making the prices drop.
hundreds of workers spread the pods out on the ground. The desert climate dries the chilies quickly and makes them keep for longer. But there is one more problem. The harvester can't remove the stems from the fruit. They have to go. Otherwise, the chilies can't be sold. But the laborious manual labor doesn't ruin most of the workers' appetites. Now the chilies have to dry on the hot ground for 10 days. Every two days, the workers shift them about. While doing so, great care needs to be taken as they may not contain any moisture anymore. Farm owner Ma Wei Qiang regularly checks that his workers are doing a good job. After all, his yearly income is laid out here. In this year, the yield was almost 1,000 kilos. That makes about $150,000. A lot of money in this region. Now we know what these red fields are. Each year, about 200,000 tons of chilies are produced in this region. Lots of it ends up in factories and then goes to supermarkets all over the world as chili powder, paste, or as sauce, because the spice is growing ever more popular.